uh, we hope you'll uh, stay around. Uh, the event, as you can see, is being live streamed to Facebook, uh, as well as um, what's happening here. And uh, this event, before I introduce our speakers, is uh, happening as part of uh, the Global People's Summit on Food System, a three-day event that started yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, this is an event that's organized by 22 networks and movements from around the world with focus on food sovereignty. And uh, it's happening in the opposition to the UN Food System Summit that is going to happen tomorrow in New York, 23rd of September. And the reason why we are opposing it is because it's been subject to corporate takeover. For all the past years, this summit has been organized by the FAO, mandated by members of the UN to do so. This year is organized together with the World Economic Forum, which is a private entity representing corporate interests. Uh, excuse me for a moment, because I'm getting a call here from our missing speaker, Henry, over to you for some housekeeping. Okay, hi everyone. So basically uh, the structure of this event will be uh, short presentations. Uh, from the three speakers, Camilla will be focusing on the on the techno side of it, um, speaking from her experience, particularly in the climate negotiations. Um, and then we'll be moving to Azra uh, and and then Helena. Then we'll have a Q and A where you'll be able to. For those of you who are on Zoom, you can um, ask the questions in person. Turn on your camera and microphones to do so. Uh, that will last for 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and then we'll break into small groups to discuss um, some questions that we've prepared earlier about developing campaigns and getting this message out there. Uh, Thank you. So I just had a, a call from Ezra, and she is about to join us. Uh, uh, she has... Uh, squeeze in this event because uh, her she's involved in other events as part of the Global People Summit in, in Pakistan. And uh, so she just made a bit of time here to come and share. And um, can you see her on, online? Here she is. Just yes, coming. that's great. All right, so in that case, we probably will start with Azra as yes. she's the most time sensitive one. Hi, Ezra. Welcome. Are you are you with us? She is. I'm just asking to start her video. Here she comes. Hi. Oh, Hello. good. Ezra, thank you for making the time. We know how busy you are. We'll let you go first. You on mute? Yeah. I'm really Welcome. sorry. I thought I had. We had we were going to finish before two thirty, but my apologies to everybody. Uh, thank you, thank you. So welcome to Azra. She doesn't have much time because you're on to another thing afterwards, right? And Azra is a renowned political activist from Pakistan, and she's uh, the head of Roots for Equity, uh, that works with uh, small farmers, landlords, peasants, women, and youth. And you can see that they have uh, already, you started yesterday with the Global People Summit. We saw you yesterday at the plenary and the farmers that were with you. And we hope you can come and share a little bit about, particularly about the free trade treaties uh, and how it's affecting our food systems everywhere and our rights to food sovereignty. So over to you. Um. Thank you so much. Um, so let me start with, uh, let me start with 1995. Although free trade has been going on um, for, for the country to which I belong, Pakistan and India, uh, free trade was actually brought by the British in the 1800s, in the 1700s. And uh, they were responsible for the death and destruction of our lands and our people in a very big way. 
Uh, as you saw, we had farmers yesterday and we've been going through two days of training on trade liberalization with farmers on how to fight uh, the current uh, onslaught, which is amazingly uh, destructive and it's very difficult for us at this point. Um, so the, with the creation of the WTO was very much because of the crisis of the crisis of the uh, of the developed world of the rich capitalist countries, specifically the, the United States. And for them, the creation of the World Trade Organization was very much to try and create a monopoly for their corporations. Um, and it was a um, uh, it was kind of a uh, alliance with the other um, capitalist countries, specific the G7 countries. And if you know the agreements within the WTO, the, especially the agreement on agriculture, if you know the agreement on TRIPS specifically, the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, the SPS, which is the sanitary and phytosanitary mechanisms and TBT, technical barriers to trade, these together are like a stranglehold on the lives and livelihoods of small farmers uh, in Pakistan, in South Asia, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, all over the world, even the small farmers of the developed countries are not able to survive because of the kind of conditions that are created for the corporations. Uh, since uh, I don't know how much time I have, I will try uh, just use a very current uh, issue that is extremely difficult for our women farmers, for landless women farmers in my country. Azra, Azra, yes. sorry to interrupt. Can you move your screen down a little bit so we can see your whole face? Oh yeah, much, a little more, a little Is more. Little, little more, like that, much better. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's really important to see you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so in my country, 65% of the land is with only 5% of families. This was the kind of land distribution that the British created when they were leaving this, this part of the world, or even before that, so that they could create a very big feudal culture, uh, people who could control the land and the workers um, and stop resistance, you know, immediately stop resistance. So today, 65% almost of the land is only with 5% of families and a very large part of the, of the people who farm are landless. Now, uh, a critical part of our economy, of our agriculture economy, is that even if you're landless, people will, will um, breed animals, will breed livestock. And especially for women, they will breed goats and uh, cows and buffaloes. These are the three, buffaloes and cows are more expensive, but, uh, but goats are very, very easy to keep. This is the genetic material which is equivalent to the genetic material of seeds. Um, and I think it's very well known now how the genetic material of seeds has already been captured by big corporations. And they have introduced genetically engineered seeds in, uh, in, especially in cotton, now also in maize, the big grains which are of critical importance to agriculture in the modern agriculture. And so when women have no land, you know, and they will keep livestock, they don't have enough space to grow fodder. And what has uh, the SPS and TBT uh, agreements done to the lives of women is that um, there are regulations within SPS and TBT which controls all food products which are obtained from plants and animals. And so in the context of India, Pakistan specifically, milk is a very, very, um, valuable resource, not in terms of commodity, but in terms of nutrition. And in terms of the kind of nutrition which milk gives to families, both India, Pakistan, we are milk drinkers. In our villages at night, they will not cook anything, they will only have milk. And women, if they can really afford to, they would collect the milk and make butter out of it and cream. Let's see something which we drink a lot because it is very hot and let's see cools us down. So these are, integral parts of a climate and how we survive this very hot season. Now, what the uh, TBT and SPS has done is that they have asked the Codex Elementarius, which is a body within the FAO and WHO, they have said, 
that you have to have very high standards on uh, on uh, trade in these products. And we were just talking just two minutes before this session that who trades milk, who trades uh, wheat? We don't trade that. We just produce and we consume right there. We pick the vegetables from our gardens and eat it in the very in that day or at the most in the next couple of days. So who trades? We all know that the, these really humongous corporations trade. And a gentleman was just telling us, you know what they have? They have huge chillers. And from every farmer, they will dump milk into that chiller. And so the quality of that milk is so uh, mixed up. There is contaminated milk, there is good milk, there is a bad milk, there is a healthy animal, there is a sick animal. And all of that goes into the chiller and into these packets, which is then, um, which is then um, promoted as safe milk. And this is what the TBT says, the technical barriers to trade says, that the labeling should be good, it should have traceability of where the product came from, and it should have um, all the instructions on, on, on the quantity of, of the milk, what the milk contains, so that is TBT. The SPS says that uh, the, the, the quality of the milk itself has to be on these standards. And if it's the milk is not pasteurized, then this milk is not safe. In our country, we don't pasteurize milk. And we have a civilization which is 5,000 years old. The Indus Valley civilization is next door to uh, where I live in Karachi. The Harappa civilization is just two hours away from Lahore. So we are very ancient civilization. We have kept cattle all our lives. We have some of the best quality of cattle in the world. And then they tell us that the standard of our milk is not up to standard. So. And that is just a way to create monopoly in the market. Today, the government of Pakistan is on the brink of saying that we have to have pasteurized milk. So the small farmers, especially the women, cannot pasteurize milk. And I'm talking about millions and millions of women who own livestock. You know, in a country which is so patriarchal, which is so feudal, livestock is easy to access because they can grow. They will buy an, an, a small calf or a kid and because that is cheaper and make it grow and then have kids from that animal. And so they grow their herd. In any case, we don't keep very big herds, three, four animals maximum. No, but it is something like a bank balance to women. The, the milk has butter, has ghee, the, the clarified butter, I think you guys call it. And so all of that is extremely nutritional. Second, the animal gives um, animal manual. The whole of rural communities in my country do not have uh, gas. They do not have electric ovens. They don't have any of this. They just use either wood or the manure as burning fuel for their, for their kitchen. And if they don't have animals, how are they going to keep their kitchens going? You know, and women will make a small cake-like uh, products from the dung, animal dung, and use it in, the, in their own homes and then sell it. Women who do not have animals will go to the people who have animals, make the dunks for them, give them half of it back and bring half for home. I met a woman, an old woman, and she had a daughter who was not well. And so they both of them could not go pick wood from, for, their, for their fuel. And so what they did was they kept a small goat and they were keeping the goat manure for their fuel. So the, you know, the, the, the poor communities, try to manage their lives and they have so little. And it's because of the, uh, of the feudal culture of our countries and top now with the semi-feudal relationships which our countries have with these G7 countries and the corporations which control uh, uh, the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank. I don't have the time to explain the connections. You know, IMF, you know, has terrible connections to the World Trade Organization. And I've not even gone Ezra? into the budget. G, sorry. No, uh, I, I just want to, if you could say, I know you, you are in a real hurry and-, and No, no, go ahead. I'm so, not in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, uh, could you just say a little bit about what you mentioned in, in a previous session about the need to join forces to address the whole free trade dogma as a whole rather than a treaty by treaty opposition? Thank you. Exactly, exactly. I, um, and this is what I just said about 15 minutes ago, that 
um, if we go into a scientific, uh, economic, intellectual activity of trying to understand the various agreements within the WTO, the bilateral agreements, the CPEC agreement, the Chinese agreements, uh, we can't do it. We don't have the resources. The only way, and there is no need, you can't keep on studying the same science over and over, the science of oppression, the science of exploitation. We don't need to study it anymore. We understand where the root of oppression is. Um, in context to third world countries, we believe the, the front forces are the workers and the farmers. They make up 80% of our populations. And we believe that these forces, the organized forces of the, of the peasants and of the workers will and certainly change uh, this balance of power at the moment. Uh, we believe that it is now neither a North fight nor a South fight. It is a fight of the people against the corporations. And the people of the North and the people of the South really need to come together. You know, uh, COVID-19 has given us one thing. It has taken a lot. It has given us mechanisms to unite. Uh, a year ago, I did not even know how to use any of this. And now, you know, I can do it on my phone. I can do it everywhere. All of us can do it as a unity. The, the people from the rural areas can unite with us in the urban areas and with you in the uh, international arenas. And this is what we really need to do. We need to bridge that gap. We need to find out what are the mechanisms that it, that um, one thing which I would say though, is that the understanding of the literate people, of the educated people, of urban societies, their understanding of what the oppressed are going through is very minimal. And I think that is such a barrier because women in my country will also say, you know, these educated women will say, we should give one acre of land to women. And I find that so simplest, simplistic. And I find that very, it's very, it's extremely deterrent to fighting a real fight. So to me, uh, I think the unity is number one, trying to understand in detail the lives of the, the producers, you know, whether it is a fisher folk, whether it is uh, livestock uh, custodians, whether it is uh, farmers or anybody who produces who actually is not making a living out of it. There is a big gap between the urban and the, and the rural. There is a big gap between the educated and the uneducated. And I, for us to fight as a unity, that gap needs to be minimized and taken away. We have to come down to the level of the most oppressed and start our fights from there. That I, I even though I totally 100% believe in the unity of the people, I believe that there are groups of us who are all fighting corporations. There are uh, different, um, income levels, different professionals who have a very different understanding of what the problem is. And that is where the unity has to come. Without creating that unity, it is, uh, and largely the educated people are more of a barrier than a help. I say this with a lot of uh, caution and with a lot of hurt, but the educated people really sometimes do not understand the oppression that the poor people face and do not understand the anger, the extreme anger that these people have inside them. And that anger is, will be channeled in a very, in a wrong way. We have Taliban in, in, in our front of us, you know? And so the unity has to come through starting from the ground, from the ground of the press. And uh, that unity has to be built. And there are many layers amongst us that needs to be crossed. Um, like you and I talking on the Zoom. I'm not sure I totally understand who the local initiatives are, but I'm still willing to talk. But that those gaps need to be addressed much more scientifically in people's science. Thank you so much, Ezra. If you have time to stay on for questions, so we're just gonna hear, hear from Camilla now, who, who is a renowned, uh, critique of, uh, of uh, climate negotiations and, and independent research. And then from Helen, then we move on to some questions. And afterwards, we're having some brainstorming. We don't expect any of you to stay around for that. 
well, I hope we hope as many of you will stay around, but we don't expect everybody to stay around. Could I uh, also Camilla, just say, okay. I, I would love, I sorry, in case you can't stay on, I just hope that we'd be able to have a conversation later on, because I think you would agree that another unifying factor in our campaigns is for all of us to understand what this corporate takeover means. Even for sort of middle class people in the West, we're talking about democracy having been abandoned. We're talking about toxic food that, as you probably know, this generation in America is going to die younger than their parents because they're being fed high fructose corn syrup. They're being bombarded with adverts. So there is a lot of ill health and suffering that I think if we can focus on this corporate system together uh, for various reasons, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have a lot in common if we have a chance to talk more. Thank sure. you, I just, I just said. Oh, sorry, Ezra, sorry. No, it's okay. I will just stay here and eat while you guys go on. Thank you. Very appropriate. Camilla, over to you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, and good afternoon and good uh, night for the other time zones. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. And uh, I would like to start with some storytelling picking up from what uh, Asha was uh, so beautifully explaining and articulated, um, articulating to us. She referred uh, to Pakistani women that in a patriarchal uh, country own cattle and this cattle is so important. And then she described it to allow sovereignty for them autonomy for them because they use the manure from the cattle to cook out of this cooking they produce uh, um, uh, food that they can sell in the market and they can exchange and she explained it systemically how people and ecosystems how nature and humans are uh, in in a social relation uh, as we have in rural communities uh, unified so uh, I've been following the climate negotiations now for since 2008. So it's going to be uh, 13 years, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with this COP. Uh, and uh, at some point in, in the middle of the process of negotiating this uh, road towards a Paris Agreement that was signed in 2015, we had this interim moment between the end of the Kyoto um, Protocol, the time bounded uh, that uh, was the Kyoto Protocol and the transition to a new phase of the regime, which we now uh, know dominates everything and puts together uh, develop in developing countries. And in this interim moment of climate negotiations, uh, it's, it's quite absurd for people that are not inside. There was an entire COP um, in 2013 that was held in Warsaw, uh, where the bus of the two weeks climate talk, not of course inside the little rooms, but everywhere, you know, in the booths and in the um, political speeches was about saving women from those archaic forms of energy that uh, we needed to have this global alliance uh, for sustainable energy for all. And uh, a huge coalition was the global alliance for clean cook stoves. Cook stoves were portrayed as like this evil source of emissions that were uh, submitting women to cooking and to smoking and to health problems. And I mean, they, they would start to tell all the horrible rural lives that people were like obliged to cook with manure, that manure of course was not sanitary, was dirty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know how all this hygiene uh, paradigm, you know, has historically pushed forward, hygienist ideologies push forward uh, capitalism. 
But the, the tricky part of the Global Alliance for Sustainable Cookstoves was that uh, it was uh, the source in, in, this, uh, um, in, the, in this few years where you didn't have clear where the regime was going, where very poor country, countries, the least developed countries, this is a coalition in itself, could issue carbon credits out of cookstoves. And the rich countries could buy carbon credits to compensate emissions from industrial sources in the North, steaming from women cooking with those cookstoves. Of course, uh, uh, at this uh, moment, uh, they were not the cookstoves with manure anymore, were patent cookstoves that companies were distributing and that uh, would be fueled by batteries and by uh, those uh, biofuels that uh, uh, were being produced, of course, industrial biofuels. So why I'm telling you uh, this uh, story? Because it's important to connect. I want to talk a little bit about this techno takeover and this transition from, from democracy towards technocracy, a vision of the future that we are going to be governed by international uh, uh, artificial intelligence and, and how instead of uh, uh, chasing and, in and, in and identified the root causes of our oppression towards where the systemic oppression is leading us, uh, we are in this uh, very, a lot of us, you know, captured by the dominant narrative to focus on this idea of leaving no one behind, that we have one future for all of us, this future that is horribly being designed by corporation and that is being sold uh, by, by means of this SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, this global agenda that is a, port, uh, a portmanteau for the trade agenda. So my point, um, I like it very much the historical um, uh, timeline that Asra brought to us, connecting us to the WTO, to the 1990s, when I think people had more, uh, more clear vision where the, the power really comes from, to jump to 2021, where we are, and this critical juncture of history. You know, we are living still through the times of COVID and this global readjustment, or, or uh, let me say, forced evolution, uh, together with some controlled demolition of the dismantling of our local economies. Uh, and this is not to deny the pandemic and the people that have died and are you know, really struggling to survive in this means, but to try to look, to step back and to look as how the COVID uh, conveniently suits this wider agenda. This agenda of uh, global environmental governance, may I say, uh, that is uh, increasingly fusion with the digital transformation. I think it's important to look how, for instance, the uh, European Union bloc uh, is uh, calling their uh, Green Deal. They refer constantly, that is a twin transformation, it's digital and green. So the whole process of decarbonizing the economy can only be brought about, can only be uh, produced by means of this entirely digital transformation of the world. This goes together with understanding that we are living through a shift of historical paradigm, the so-called fourth industrial revolution that the overdominant infrastructure that connects everything is the implementation of 5G. And a lot of people are saying, uh, fast forwarding to 6G by the end of this decade, that envisions uh, a globalized, a fully globalized world connected by the internet of things, ruled by uh, smart contracts, blockchain, trustability, um, enhanced reality, augmented reality, all new kinds 
mediate all new ways mediated by this super high tech technology through which we are going to live as a society. I've been uh, a very strong uh, critic, critic, critic uh, of this process because this is being ruled by unelected people, people that have never proposed wide in the open where do they see us going as humanity? Uh, what is the vision? What is the clear vision that they have for the future of society? And how we got to this point where few, a few elite of technocratic people, for instance, those who meet at the World Economic Forum, uh, and here uh, I pause and remember to you that the global, uh, the World Social Forum uh, inaugurated in 2001 was in uh, direct opposition to the World Economic Forum, this WTO, you know, uh, uh, war room. Uh, and maybe we, ha we have forgotten about that because a lot of people in social movements today uh, see that is, it's important to be a part of the World Economic Forum, to shake hands with this class of people that will, you know, transnational governance, transnational interest, profit, and this standardization, this pasteurization of the world that uh, Asma was so beautifully uh, comparing with the process of the milk. Indeed, you know, this, uh, this unifying uh, vision for the future of commodities and trade, it's key to, to understand, you know, wider dynamics that the COVID is helping to implement and to legitimize so pacifically because we see uh, almost no opposition or at least a very few connection with what is this biosecurity state that we are walking towards. What does it mean for, this, uh, for us who are living in Europe or had to travel to present uh, sanitary passes, to be scanned, to have uh, barcodes, to be uh, tested all the time, like collecting your genetic material to uh, a series of profiling, you know, DNA profiling of people. So uh, I think it's a, it's a big uh, challenge uh, for uh, us to build a unified movement. I must say uh, a, a movement that is committed to the human race against the this non-human uh, artificial intelligence future that is being sold to us to uh, step back, to be ready to challenge some uh, deep-seated assumptions that we are really uh, discussing the governance of climate or that climate, this uh, above all, is the, the thing that needs to be saved instead of actually looking and fighting down to the earth, understanding that without land, there is no future. Uh, one mantra that I have when I, uh, of course, when I have more time and I expose, you know, this alternative view of climate negotiation is to remember the adage, as above, so below. So, all the time that people are discussing how to capture carbon, how to avoid emissions, how to go to net zero, how to do negative emissions technology, et cetera, et cetera. What we're really talking about is about the below. It's about the takeover, the land grabbing, the submission of life forms and livelihoods to this vision of a technocratic ruled world where no one non-elected people are deciding about our future behind closed doors. And that the, the, this um, mantra also that corporations are going out to save us through their conversion to a more inclusive capitalism through uh, environmental and social governance principle to whatever they say, deforestation free commodity chain, supply chains, uh, slave, uh, child labor free um, um, uh, supply chains. What it's all about is about imposing technology, imposing traceability, 
imposing control in hand in hand with this new nation state that has invested itself the role of the sanitary Leviathan to control and to monitor all our lives. So uh, I stop here because I'm very interested to, to, to go to the debate, to listen to Helena and to go to the debate and see how can we uh, together can build alliances to resist and to transform this green future that is sold to us. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, powerful as always. Over to Helena, who's the founder and director of Local Futures. And yes, as um, my work started in the mid 70s, I was thrown into a situation in Ladakh and Bhutan where I was able to live in and speak the language of people who had not been colonized. So I so agree with you, Azra, that it's very important to understand that this colonial system goes back to the 1700s. And I really have tried to raise awareness about the fact that there's been a, a continuous uh, path where people have been forced off the land in order to be enslaved to the needs of global traders. So with the enclosures in Europe, and with slavery and genocide on the other side of the world, a system was set up that favored those that were globally active. And that of course benefited the elites in Pakistan and India. At that time, Pakistan didn't exist, but you know, the, the elites around the world benefited from this global system. So later on, I helped to found the International Forum on Globalization. We had a very um, systematic focus with colleagues from around the world, trying to raise awareness about these new trade treaties that from the mid eighties were gaining more momentum. The whole process of trade deregulation had been brought in with the World Bank and the IMF after the Second World War. But even the critics from the so-called Third World or Global South, as well as from activists, both social activists and environmental activists in the West, they would focus on the World Bank and the IMF, but this process of trade treaties was not very well understood, not very well studied, and unfortunately, I would say that in the last, um, where are we now? In the last 20 years or so, that propaganda for free trade treaties being the way to grow the economy is something that has been pushed on governments and on their populations. There's been just constant barrage of how, how, how are these trade treaties going to be affected? We're going to have to do what we can to make sure that we can have a fair trade deal between countries. So we have a big task ahead of us. And I think, Azra, I really hope that you're still there because I think it's vital that we work across North and South and that we help activists, whether they're concerned with climate change, whether they're concerned with ill health, with the loss of democracy, with now the war machine, you know, this plenty of money to buy nuclear submarines from Australia, but no money to look after their people or the land. We're in a very dire situation. And Camilla has helped us see this very clear threat now with the UN supporting this romanticization of robots as the next stage. We are being actually subjected even online to romanticization of robots, being able to spray more efficiently on the land than human beings can do. We're being told that AI-led education will allow us to target to the individual need of children. What we're actually talking about is a dehumanized global system that simply cannot respect diversity, cannot support, cannot respect 
whether it's indigenous species of goats and cows, whether it's indigenous grains or individual human beings. We're talking about a very frightening leap into a massive scaling up and speeding up of corporate control. It's the corporate structure we need to focus on. There may be many other things we need to look at as well, but the driving mechanism that is taking the world in a disastrously wrong direction is the deregulation of global banks and the financial casino, global corporations. This is how the Bill Gates of the world and a few billionaires end up owning more than virtually half the human population. It's the structures of deregulation that give that freedom to the global players. Now, at Local Futures, the reason we've been going on and on about localizing is we see it as an opportunity for people right now to wake up to the absolute need of shortening the distances between production and consumption to create structures that will encourage and support diversity on the land, diversification, which means greater self-reliance, whether in Vermont or in, in you know, UP or in Sweden, all around the world, the shortening of the distances to establish localized systems is essential for greater self-reliance, for greater empowerment, and for reducing the gap between rich and poor. So I hope that many of you will want to join a campaign that demonstrates that we not only need to critique the systematic corporatization or globalization of our economies, of our cultures, of our identities, of our spiritual well-being, but we simultaneously need to encourage the localization, the revitalization of the community fabric, the revitalization of that deeper connection to your place on the planet, the respect for local knowledge systems, the respect for non-commercial deep knowledge systems, which the global South still have a wealth of. In most of the industrialized world, we've been removed from that knowledge, we've been removed from those skills. We are very vulnerable and we are more easily manipulated in many ways by this global system and as Camilla is saying, the language in this system now, renewable energy, biodiversity, uh, inclusiveness, justice, all the language sounds wonderful. But we have to see through that language to look at the actual structural supports. Are we gonna be supporting global corporations or are we gonna be supporting communities worldwide to have greater self-respect, greater self-reliance, greater control over their lives? Are we going to reduce the dependence on trade so that it becomes a meaningful exchange where goods cannot be produced, cannot be manufactured, they can perhaps be produced somewhere else in the world, but only through international collaboration will we have the accountability and the visibility of these structures to ensure that we're talking about genuine equity, genuine sustainability. We're talking about great complexity and people can shy away from even thinking about the global economy. It can sound too big, too difficult. What we feel so empowered by is the knowledge that almost all the crises we face are linked to that economic systemic handover, handover of democracy, handover of science, science in the name of profit, handover of our skills, of our hearts, our identities, bringing that back to genuine people power, bringing it back to the deep 
ecological place-based realities of places around the world. That's what we are about in Local Futures and we are, yeah, we're very honored to be working with GPS and hope to continue this collaboration. So thank you so much, both Azra and Camilla. And uh, we need to speed up, I think, yeah. our communication. That's correct. And speed oh, up our, our um, efforts to collaborate in a more sustained way. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Uh, we will open up for questions now. Uh, you can either write them or you can uh, unmute your mic and, uh, and present them here. Uh, we'll ask you to be brief uh, when you present your questions uh, so that we have room for more. And then we'll have about, uh, we have about 25 minutes for questions and then we'll move into the brainstorming session. Thank you. And I'd add, if you do want to ask your question on camera or through your own voice, um, raise your hand. So one of, one of the buttons down here, um, you can raise your hand so we know to unmute you, we know to turn on your camera. Okay, I, as a, Henry, I'm not seeing a raise your hand feature on my bar, I don't know. Can you say where it is? Uh, it's under reactions. So if you go to the bottom, uh, you put reaction. Oh, right. uh -huh. you that, right. and you, then you put yeah. raise hand. And you can send, um, so send little hearts and things too. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone have any particular questions at this stage or should we initially um, ask either Camilla to, or uh, Azra to respond to what Helena said um, while, ev while it all sinks in? I would love to hear Asra's response to what Camilla and I said. I'm, I mean, I absolutely agree. Um, there's, there's just no space for uh, disagreement. And I also agree that the fight has to be against corporations. Um, I would not use the word corporations. I would use the word capitalism, you know? To me, it's not just the corporations because the corporations have a huge network, a web of institutions which support them uh, in giving them power that they have. That is why organizations like us, when we mobilize our, uh, our, the groups where we work, whether it is women or it is small farmers or landless people, we, uh, we engage in with them the policy framework because when they have to uh, compete with New Jersey cows or these Australian cows, we need to tell them why this is happening. So um, I 100% I agree with you that it is the corporations who rule the world, but it is just not corporations. The system is of capitalism. That's why during COVID-19, people have been going out of space. I mean, how more sick can you get? Millions of people died, people are suffering, there is hunger and three or four people get into a shuttle and go off of the earth. I mean, these people are not humans, you know? They are Draculas in living life. And we need to understand that. So my only disagreement is the word corporations. Well, I, I would love you to look at a short film we made called, uh, called Local, a story of hope. Because I think when we analyze the structures, we'll find that this capitalist system was born out of this global expansion, enclosures and slavery. And I, I think it's very, very helpful to keep our eye on that and of the destruction of indigenous cultures. So one of my hesitations in talking about capitalism is that there have been many critics of capitalism that from my point of view had not had enough deep respect for local knowledge systems and their ecological uh, consequences. So the deep ecological wisdom that would lead to a deep respect for local knowledge has not been a part of the critique of capitalism. And that's why I somehow feel that highlighting local as opposed to global can be helpful. And there's been another problem on the left that has been critical of capitalism. And that is that because they've so 
firmly believed in international collaboration and international solidarity, from my point of view, they got confused and often manipulated into not critiquing the international collaboration between corporations and banks. And therefore they didn't pay enough attention to that globalizing process. But you know, it's a long discussion, but those will be some of my comments. And by the way, did you know Maria Mies? Azra, did you know Maria Mies? Yes, um, I met her uh, many, many years ago with Vandana. You know, I, I know Vandana and uh, I used to meet Maria with Vandana. I didn't know her directly, but through Vandana. Oh, well, she was a very close friend of mine. And so I've, I've known her since the 70s. And by the way, I also know Imran Khan personally. And I don't know how easy now it would be to try to reach him again with these issues, but he certainly was. When he was in England and he first decided to go back to Pakistan, he was quite aware of these issues. I don't know what's happened now, but that's, it's another story, I suppose. You can keep it for another time. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, Camilla, did you want to say something? Yes, yes, yes. I want to, um, to say something that um, I agree uh, with Asfa um, that we can not only speak about corporations. Uh, I think capitalism, although the left has, um, uh, has a, today, in my opinion, a very shallow, naive, and, uh, and, and misdirected understanding of what capitalism is all about, uh, I think we should not underestimate uh, uh, and go back to the first people that actually tried to get this uh, big understanding of what this, this new system of organizing uh, social relations and production was about. Um, for instance, there is the corporations of the cor corporate form. There is the whole fin financialization process that is very important also uh, to understand, but the, it's based on the spiritual subject of capitalism. Uh, that has been scrutinized as how you embody uh, this uh, form, uh, uh, this fetishized form of relating to the world. You alienate the process of capitalism, is of the alienation of your autonomy, of your consciousness. And uh, there is this unsurmountable uh, individual instance where people become complices, they become part of the systems, they feed the system with a capitalist mentality. Uh, there is a branch of uh, economic sociology, and I have uh, addressed this in this booklet, Carbon Metrics, about the quantification, the idea of uh, thinking of value in terms of um, uh, uh, checks and of, of a ledger book, of a commercial ledger book. Uh, yes, the left, uh, for instance, the international progressive now uh, sees the financial system and as uh, the Helena said, the more and more wildly globalized system as something that we need to save our, uh, us out of a global problem. So my critique, for instance, to, to the left is this misuse of Marx or a very, very shallow reading of Marx uh, for people who study it, really, you know, uh, you can see that the late Marx, the so-called late Marx and the Russian road. So when Marx died, he was actually two years before dying, he was replying to the Russian, uh, to the populist uh, uh, um, movement in Russia about, uh, okay, what do we need to do to the revolution? Do we need to industrialize, to form a proletarian class, to then overturn and build another system? We are a country that is 98, 99% rural communes. And Marx himself replied in a letter to Vera Zulich in 1881, saying that whatever he has said in the first book of, Chap of Cap Das Kapital about the transformation that happened in England, that is not a blueprint for the world. Russia could have jumped to a more evolved uh, uh, stage of evolution uh, uh, as he saw uh, a communist future by means of the rural community, the rural commune itself. 
Of course, this was not a very inter interesting debate. This letter, of course, was kept. It was uh, made public many decades later, uh, decades after the Russian Revolution, but has sparked when discovered this whole stream of theoretical debates about what was uh, uh, Marx going towards. What we have as the canons of the left is a, a so sad uh, ready body of thinking, a theory from Marx. Uh, I don't agree. I think Marx has gave us method, the method we need to apply to the actually existing capitalism and its contradictions and not a blueprint of how we are going to be. And I think every time the left becomes prescriptive, uh, for instance, signing up blindly to, we need a great uh, new deal, a green new deal. We need to decarbonize those big agendas. They are uh, uh, betraying Marx because they are not doing the work of looking through, of trying to see what is the fetishism of what is being sold to us. So I do believe that it's important to address the, 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 the cultural impacts of capitalism as a system that has imposed a society that is mediated through commodities and that everything needs to be commodified to have an existence in this system. So the struggle is to decommodify our thinking, our exchanges, our logic and our world. The corporations are, yes, are very, they are a very important form and carrier of those systems but they do not stand alone as you know, the only thing that we get rid of, we will uh, uh, go back to a more humane or go forward not to a more humane system of living in this planet Earth. I just very quickly want to add that I completely agree you know, with both of you in many ways. It's just that I think we do need to be looking at certain key structures and so it's not only about adding ending commodification, it's about the absolute need for rebuilding the fabric of interdependence. This is a profound and vitally important fact of life that we evolved in intergenerational communities. We evolved deeply connected to the plants, to the animals, to the water, to the soil. We must rebuild that fabric of interdependence for our health, for our sanity. This also means rebuilding the respect for experiential knowledge, which is holistic knowledge, deep experience. This is why in Yastat they had to change the language away from just saying science to acknowledging knowledge uh, that was in the global south, so many owners of knowledge that had just been dismissed because it wasn't science. So it is, of course, much, much more than just corporations. But again, what I'm trying to have us look at is the global nature of it and that the global corporations beyond the visibility of the nation state, we're not paying enough attention to them. We end up thinking too much about the governments that have become servants to those global entities. And those global entities, you know, no one gets to vote for them, as you were saying, Camilla. And of course, we know now that when we vote within our own countries, what's going on? They, they're ignoring what they promise us they're going to care about, our jobs, our environment, climate. And then suddenly, once elected, they're listening to some other voices, well, those voices, again, from that global, that it's absolutely a systemic process and capital commodification was a central part of it, but what it did to human relationships, what it did to our relationship to nature, what it did to our relationship to ourselves, our sense of being worthwhile and, and, have, and, and feeling that we're worthwhile and have self-respect is fundamental to also the respect and the tolerance for others. But yeah. And I Thank see you. something. Asra, over to you. Yeah, I, I, this is what I meant, you know, when I said that there is a lot of disconnect between uh, different groups of people across the world. And uh, this will really need some 
uh, not a half hour or one hour Zoom, it will really need a lot more of discussion. Uh, what we believe, at least in the movements where we are very active in Pakistan and everywhere, is that it is the masses which in your terms are the local people, are the local communities. They are the forefront of the fight. And I do not believe that this will be a bloodless fight, no matter what any of us think. Um, because the powerful uh, in our countries use uh, weapons uh, to discredit, to discredit uh, our movements, our calls, our demands. Every time we raise something that is very, very uh, critical to our survival on this planet, they call us a criminal. We can be called a terrorist, we could be called a uh, somebody who has occupied land, we could be called anything, you know, we could be called a robber, and we are shot, and we are killed. So our reality of when you talk about uh, the local communities, our reality of local communities is very different from what you're saying. The local communities have no space left to use the indigenous knowledge that they have, the very ingrained, extremely powerful knowledge that they have, which can save the world. Yes, I believe that. Yeah. But it's not there anymore to practice because they have everything has been taken away from them by a gun by the use of force yeah. and we will have to answer in the same way there is no there is no other choice we don't want bloodshed we don't want our children to be killed we don't want ourselves to be killed but we have no choice i think that is the difference between the north and the south we have no choice well um, it, 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 i would say that within the western world there is still this semblance of democracy and the belief that there is a democratic process. So we are very much trying to raise awareness to those groups of people to say, we have very little time left because the brutal force of this system is making itself more and more visible. But while there is space, let's speak out, let's gather and let's link up with those groups in the global south. I am very much wedded to encouraging nonviolent approaches I believe that our greatest power will be the, the common sense, the bigger picture, because we're talking about life on Earth. We're not talking about going rapidly to a planet that no one can inhabit. And what happens to the farmers of the world, what happens to the food of the world, is what happens to the health of our bodies, of our spirits, of the water, of the soil. It's the fundamental issue. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, I can understand why you feel you have no choice, but I fear that where the guns are, where the power is, where that military force is, is exactly in that corporate global structure and that we simply would not have a chance of winning if we resort to the guns. We are the majority. We are so many. Why on earth are we allowing this tiny minority with fake money. They have completely fake money. It's not real wealth. Why are we giving them so much power? So that, that sort of would be my, my argument is that we unwittingly are handing over power and, and that needs to stop as soon as possible. <laughs> and this is also why we are shifting in uh, to talking about campaigning around these issues because it's very, very difficult uh, to get people to look at and oppose the mechanisms uh, that are behind this very insidious global casino economy, which is, you know, clearly neo-colonialism, oppressing the majority of people, undermining our food systems, you know, uh, eliminating our farm and so forth, no? Uh, and, uh, but how do we do that? How do we make these uh, invisible mechanisms known to people so that they know what to oppose, to, so they know what to, to change? And, and uh, I don't know, we're gonna shift into that conversation now with the participants that want to stay with us. I don't want to know if uh, any of you three, Helena, Camilla or uh, Ezra want to say something about that. 
how we make that visible before we, I know you all have to leave. So, uh, or if you don't, please stay on. I really need to leave, leave now. Uh, what did you say? What do we need to make visible? The, the hidden mechanisms that enable this system, you know, uh, which are, you know, the so-called free trade treaties, for example, the subsidies to the big and the global that at the same time undermine the tax exemptions, the, you know, all these political structures that are man-made, they can be remade and they're the, what's enabling this continuous uh, growth of this global juggernaut, no? But we are not seeing it. So a lot of people are, you could say, opposing the wrong things, proposing the wrong things, or at least things that are very ineffective and end up as downstream solutions that won't take us very far. And at, at the same time, they also you know, one of the key mechanisms is the regulations and the laws. So the regulations worldwide are strangling the small and the local, even the national players while the global players are telling governments what to do. Governments are being told, if you don't give us freedom to extract more money out of your land, out of your people, we will sue you in these kangaroo courts. So we're having, you know, it is very important that we expose that. I would so love to stay with all of you and have a discussion about what this incredibly important deadline, uh, you know, to do. So I'm, I must go, but, Thank you all so much. Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Ezra has left us. On to next thing, Camilla. Yes, I'm sorry. I also have to leave because I'm rushing around too. Yeah. Uh, but I just wanted to say that uh, one of the hidden uh, or the political infrastructures uh, that were man-made and that we should challenge is are always our mental infrastructures the uh, basic categories through which we think the world, but we do not think about them. And my uh, mega example always uh, are the carbon metrics. How we have accepted to reduce the complexity of climate change and the ecological challenge to one universal metric, to one unit of conversion that can explain everything, that can have a global price, and that speaks the language of the corporations. Just to remind you that the metric system, uh, where, by the way, the carbon metric relies upon, because we sell metric tons of, of carbon, uh, of CO2 in the market, it was an invention to facilitate global trade. People always have made trade and have their own systems of weights and measures to find equity in the exchange and barter they made. Once you had a, a world system being forged through you know, uh, the, the, the navigations, the colonization of uh, uh, my continent, for instance, uh, or where I come from, Brazil, you needed to have a unified system for global trade and the invention and imposition of the metric system was a fundamental laystone to pave the way to the globalized trade system we have today. So I would plead uh, you to go uh, radical in the sense of going to the roots and also be a uh, healthy skeptical of what the whole carbon metrics uh, uh, has behind it and how it actually demolishes and extinguishes and eradicates local diversified ecological knowledge that would help us to fight climate change. Very important. Thank you. Camilla, you mentioned earlier on a booklet about carbon metrics that I think you've written. Uh -huh. Can you have, do you have a link to it? Um, not here, but I can I can send you. Uh, I have and then, that. I'll put oh, you have it here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and it's about uh, carbon metrics, global abstractions, and ecological epistemicide. And epistemicide talks about the concept of you can kill an epistem, you can kill a knowledge system. So you do have violence, but uh, physical violence, uh, as Azra was saying, uh, with guns and with evictions. But we do also have violence that happens when people are stripped 
out of their knowledge systems, when their knowledge systems are killed, and when we are uh, suffering symbolic violence, when through the language of uh, capitalism, you are imposing upon us this whole symbolic world where the meaning is not our meaning, but the meaning are meanings that are being imposed on us and built very sophisticated through propaganda. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, just Thank a second. Uh, I think you uploaded the version from 2015. There is a version from 2016 where the, the novelties of the Paris Agreement are already incorporated. Oh, okay, thanks. I will try and find that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Camilla, thanks, Camilla, thanks for joining lovely us. Lovely seeing you. you. Thank you. you. Know. Thank you to all. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Speak soon. Take care. Bye. Right. So. Yeah. That was a, a lot, a very in, a intense discussion, a lot of information, um, and um, not many questions, but I can, it's pretty overwhelming, so I'm not, not surprised. But uh, I hope we will get to talk about this in the conversation now. So I just want to say a little bit about uh, uh, what's happening now, or what we hope will happen, is that we need kind of uh, your brain thoughts, ideas uh, about campaigning on these issues. Because as part of this uh, global uh, people's uh, summit on food systems, we all the organizations and movements have been involved are coming with, up with some action plan for campaigns around these issues uh, and uh, around the issues of food sovereignty and healthy food systems. And um, uh, local futures, we proposed uh, just very briefly a, f uh, uh, a campaign with, with focus on trade to highlight uh, the impact of trade liber liberalization uh, on, on trade practices across the world that are undermining democracies, that are undermining healthy food systems and uh, uh, marginalizing small farmers and so forth. And um, uh, we are proposing it as a campaign that can bring together not only people working around food and farming, but also we think climate activists, climate groups, uh, uh, critiques of globalization and corporatization. Um, and, uh, but uh, that was our, that's our proposal, but we are, we are struggling with find a way of, of doing it and framing it. And so we thought of using this uh, second part as a bit of a, a kind of brainstorming and focus group with you. Um, and um, so what so, we really like to do, yeah, Henry? I was just gonna say, so for this part, I'm gonna turn off, I'm gonna stop going live on Facebook. So goodbye to those of you who are following, who are watching this from there. Um, and goodbye.